I have never said that the executive should never exceed his powers. Jefferson did so in the case of the Louisiana Purchase and was justified. I have affirmed that when the executive exceeds his legal powers, if no one protests, you will lose all of your liberties. The four steps in my pilgrimage of them, the first occurred in Paris during the armistice after the 1914 war. I had had permission to go to Toulouse, and when I attempted to get back to London, I went to the consulate for my visa, the American consulate, and the whippersnapper back of the desk uh, said uh, that all Americans were to return to America. I pointed out uh, that my means of livelihood, all my possessions, my flat, were in London, upon which he disappeared behind a partition, and a nasty little whining voice was heard saying, We want them all to go back. Key words here are we want, we want. The next man they were picking on was a naval captain who hadn't got some postage stamp or other on his leave to come to Paris for a fortnight. So we got into a taxi, the captain and I, and went around to the embassy. By a million to one chance, the only American ambassador at that time, uh, who had had a law office, that is a wooden shack about 20 feet square in the Rocky Mountains in 1885 to 6, was in Paris. And uh, my father, who remembered him in the frontier days, a uh, mild sort of frontier, but still uh, Mr. Wallace at that time had uh, jumped back into his shop to uh, get his uh, six-shooter, uh, for a purpose from which my father dissuaded him. Dad had said, if you're in Paris, go in and say hello to Hugh Wallace. By the grace of God, I had gone in to see Mr. Wallace. I found a very elegant, very gentle, white-haired man sitting behind the desk, very gentle, very fatigued and he asked if he could do anything for me, and I said, no, Dad said if I was in Paris to come in and say hello to you. So not having needed anything the day before, when the naval captain and I arrived with our tale of woe, Mr. Wallace, Hugh Wallace, no relation of Henry, uh, sent us a chit back to the consulate, and our visas and permits were put in order. My argument was that if these whippersnappers were trying to push me around, they were probably trying it on many other people. And I then began my campaign in the Paris edition of the Chicago Tribune against the passport nuisance, having wandered around Europe some years before with nothing in the way of carts of identity except an unstamped membership ticket in the Touring Club de France. And Wilson, of course, in putting the $10 visa on passports, had penalized American students. The desirable or undesirable immigrant paid $10 to get into the U.S. The unfortunate American student who wanted to visit several countries in Europe got soaked from $30 to $50. The key word here was, we want. The uh, next item, I mentioned uh, these troubles to a lanky ex-Dutchman by the name of Van Dyne, no relation of Mr. Willard Huntington Wright, who wrote detective stories with that pseudonym. Van Dyne had taken out his first nationalization papers, but not his second. He was called up for the army, so he went before the tribunal in Chicago and said, I'm perfectly willing to fight in your army, but if I'm American enough to fight in your army, I got a right not to be taxed as a foreigner. He said the presiding officer leaned over the bench and said, 
Say, young fella, don't you know that in this country there ain't nobody has got any goddamn rights whatsoever? Uh, that is the second step. The third step, mentioning these two items to the prosecuting attorney for one of our largest cities, the comment offered was, all I'm interested in is bunk, seeing what you can put over. Angry K, all that I am interested in is bunk, seeing what you can put over. The discrepancy between uh, this attitude toward the law and that of the founding fathers, the distance between uh, Boston in John Adams' time and uh, one of our larger cities in uh, 1923 is considerable. I mentioned these three points to Senator Wheeler when I was in Washington in 39 trying to see if there was any way of staving off the war, uh, which followed later that year. Uh, and Senator Wheeler's comment was, uh, well, what do you expect? He's packed the Supreme Court so they will declare anything he does constitutional. Now, that is where I took off from. Uh, when the senator is unable to prevent breaches of the Constitution, and, of course, the senator, if he is not re-elected, is nobody, when the senator cannot function, the duty, as I see it, falls back onto the individual citizen. And that is why... After two years of wangling, when I got hold of a microphone in Rome, I used it. That, I think, is the necessary minimum, and a good deal has at last been verified and set down. But that's all I wish to put onto this recording, for the record. <laughs>